Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Upgrad Advantage. I am Arjun Mohan, the host for the day. And uh, Advantage is our webinar, uh, digital webinar, where we take over conversations on education and learning. The last one we did was with Economic Times, which went viral on Twitter as we had it. And uh, we had a whole lot of coverage on uh, uh, newspaper and so on and so forth. So we had a lot of pressure that this time we had to do it better. So I'm happy to inform that we had two people who can definitely take us to the next level. I'm uh, happy to welcome Christina, the CEO of Hindustan Coca-Cola Beverages and Ronnie, the co-founder and chairman of Upgrad. I'm going to just start the, start the session and they are going to have the chat and talk to you more about this very interesting topic, which has got a lot of people excited already. We're going to talk about lifelong learning. So first of all, before I start, I know that our participant doesn't need any introduction, but it's my responsibility and my care to introduce. I'll, I'll make a sentence or two about it. Uh, so Christina, uh, the, who is the CEO of HCCB. I mean, everyone knows Hindustan Coca-Cola beverages. I don't need to tell more about it. So she started her career in Diageo, was into procurement. Uh, after handling the procurement for the entire European operations of Diageo, she moved to Coca-Cola, was based out of the headquarters in Atlanta, was the chief procurement officer, and in 2017, moved to India to head HCCB. So that's Quickly about Christina, I'm sure that Christina wants to add something about it. Christina, you want to add a line or two? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to have a chat with you today. Um, yeah, actually, I started uh, my career earlier than that. So I was in the U.S. military as a cryptologist. And for those of you who don't know what a cryptologist is, it's a code breaker. And then from there went into investment banking and worked at UBS for a number of years uh, before going to Diageo. I have been so blessed and privileged to have the opportunity to work and live in over 55 countries um, and have the absolute honor to, to be uh, living uh, today in, in India um, to be part of this journey with Coca-Cola. So, so thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. Uh, so guys, I want to just uh, make this point here that Christina is joining us uh, from an upcountry location in US. It's not a very good internet she's talking in. Still, she ensured that she wants to come and talk to you all. So I want to thank you, thank her before starting on. And please bear with us. There may be slight disturbances. So if there is anything, I will act as the intermediate to explain the things which breaks off. Please bear with us. We wanted to have this session more than having it at the highest quality. So uh, next, I want to introduce someone who doesn't need any introduction. Uh, our chairman and co-founder, Roddy Skruwala, is one of the very few first generation entrepreneurs from India who has built out businesses worth billions of dollars. And very unique thing about him uh, amidst all these unicorn founders is that he has not done it once. He has done it multiple times, be it media, movies, animation, games. He has done it all. And now he is out to do the next big thing in education. He founded Upgrad in 2015. Today, Upgrad is the largest higher ed online company in the country. And uh, we focus mainly on postgraduate students soon to be part of the first online degree courses also. So that's quickly about uh, Ronnie. I'm sure Ronnie also wants to add something before I get into the details of Advantage. Yeah, thanks, Arjun. And, and good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I, I'm just fascinated in the last few months, even though we're all very, very tense about the, the pandemic, how 400 of us can get together in one room and have this conversation like it's a cozy, cozy room. And I think this is the future. And I think for all of us here, you're doing different things. You're, each of you all are doing your own multitasking. And yet you decide you know, at 5.30 to log on to what you think is going to be an interesting one hour. It's our responsibility, Christine and mine, to make it uh, an interesting one hour. But think about exactly the power of being able to come together in these kind of groups. I think learning overall is going to go to the next level just with this kind of interactive forums and the ability for us to now think very differently. So welcome and hope to make this an interesting discussion as we go forward. Thanks, Arjun. Thanks, Ronnie. That was great. 
so to explain the rules of the uh, the interaction first of all before going to that i'm sure that you will have a lot of questions please post these questions on the q and a chat not on the chat on the q and a chat please so that is it is easier for us to respond to it what we have done is that after we started sending out information about this uh, webinar we have got a lot of inputs we have got a lot of questions from our learners from people who follow upgrad people who follow hccb a whole lot of questions what they would like to ask what we have done is that we have tried to bucket them together into three different streams uh, so i will ask questions from those streams so that maximum questions are covered but feel free to post your questions also we will try to cover those also if there is a paucity of time our plan is to send you guys responses so when you are posting these questions later please feel free to drop your email id also christina and ronnie has both agreed to write uh, i mean at least tell us the responses so that we can uh, respond back to you so to sure. start with yeah uh, so one of the themes which came out very very clearly when we had this uh, whole discussion about this se session was the whole idea of generalist versus specialist so it could be because of the co because we are living in this covid times what has happened is that due to lockdown everyone is now thinking about upskilling and figuring out how do i become more and more important in my job important in my uh, in in my uh, uh, i mean in my career so on and so forth so this question was continuously coming in so what i'll do is i'll try to customize it a bit and ask uh, christina uh, uh, the first one so and and christina this information is only from linkedin so you can always correct correct me uh, if i look at your career right you have always tried to uh, i would say go deep in certain areas so i would say that you started with procurement you really went deep and specialized in it and today you are the ceo of a leading fmcg brand so what we wanted to understand was how did you continue this continue upskilling yourself when you moved from one role to another how did you ensure that you are abreast the changes happening in the industry and how did you stay ahead Thank you so much, Arjun. I, I think it's a great question. For me, learning is something that happens every single day. And I think we have to be really aware of that learning. Most of the learning for me has been uh, through, obviously, uh, qualifications, of course, but um, most of it has been on the job, uh, through formally and informally. For me, I learn uh, and try to be really mindful of learning from my peers, my boss, my team, my, my workers, um, whether they're in the factory, whether they're in the sales force, our customers, consumers, really listen to people, ask questions and wait for the answers, um, discuss things. Um, I read every day. I volunteer a lot. So if there's a project that's happening globally somewhere in the world, especially if I know nothing about it, I volunteer. I want to be involved because this is how we how we think about evolving. And then this whole new way of learning that's available digitally um, it is just a phenomenal uh, opportunity for all of us. The sheer availability of data that's available. If I think about as a child, if I wanted to learn something, I had to go down to the library and look it up in the big encyclopedias. Now we're walking around with. 100,000 encyclopedias in our pockets, not only the data, but the people and being able to talk to world leaders and have conversation is just an amazing thing. So for me, um, I think it's more about be involved as an adult. Experiential learning um, has a wonderful place and, and continuing to, to push yourselves. If you are uncomfortable that because you don't know how to do something, then that's the thing you should learn. Um, and then on a personal standpoint, I love taking different kinds of classes in my personal life, uh, recent favorites. Um, when we go someplace new, I love to take a walk with a naturalist and learn about the animals in the plant life. Pre-COVID, I took a surfing class with my teenage boys. I was terrible, but it was a fantastic experience. Um, every year I take several cooking classes for joy and, and for eating. Um, so, so really get out there. There's so many opportunities to continue to learn professionally and personally, uh, which does enrich all of us. Thank you. Yep, so I'm sure that uh, a lot of people in the audience would have 
taken a lot of ideas from out of it about how you should be continuously learning or lifelong learning as a team how it is important to practice it day in and day out i want to put the same question to ronnie in a slightly different fashion uh, so ronnie has as i told in the introduction tried out multiple industries and he has excelled in every one of them so from a external perspective Ronnie may look like a generalist, but <laughs> what I've realized after working with him is that he becomes a specialist in every industry he goes into. So uh, I want to put this question straight to him, uh, Ronnie. Where do you think this generalizing generalist versus specialist debate is going? What do you think this world is going to look like from the current trends, and what do you see in future? So you know, on a lighter note, Arjun and Christina, I would say we had uh, the Millennium Generation, then we had Generation Z, and now for all of us. It's Gen S, and what do I mean by that? That you need to be a generalist and a specialist in many ways. And this doesn't apply to a small generation. I think it's for a wider generation for all of us. We should really be looking at ourselves as Gen S. Why? Because if anyone wants to be a manager or even a general manager and then a leader, uh, you will have to look at the fact that you need. The days of saying I'm only going to be surrounded by the smartest people in the room are very much. important but you need to be equally smart in that process when you're leading a fair amount of the leadership today i think is required to lead from the front why because the world is changing too rapidly you need to be a lot more nimble and it's very difficult when you have a group of only specialists and everyone better than you so my general thought process in the 21st century is as leaders we definitely need to be a generalist and a specialist and i think christina summed it up very well about the fact of how her curiosity and her ability to look at different things keeps her mind going in that context so each one has to find their own anchor to what they want to do but today i can't say there's no room for a generalist but if you're just a generalist i think you're challenged if you're just a specialist you might be in a better place but not necessarily the top leadership place but if you're gen s i think you've got a better chance all around that's a nice term you have coined genes maybe that'll be the next big marketing uh, term out there <laughs> right so i am moving to the next theme which is a little more so i i was surprised to see a lot of questions on the industrial revolution 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution seems like a lot of people have coined this idea from the whole ai ml revolution which is going on the digitalization which is coming in so the joke which is running is that covid has done more to companies going through a digital transformation or industries going towards industry 4.0 than a cto or a cio or any ceo has ever done i mean covid just forced us to get in there right so the question to uh, christina is that how did this digital transformation steer your organization over last decade and how did it really change in the last 6 months i will ask no, one I... more question sorry uh, christina just add one more question to it so that i can set the context so one of the reasons why people were asking this question is that coke as a brand has always been fixated or stayed true to its core traits through i mean almost 100 years it's not really changed the focus on the business it's been always about uh, coca cola So, question is: Is it possible to stay like the same in the post-COVID world also? So, I'm going to couple both the questions and ask you because these were both interesting styles in which people ask the question. So, ha- happy to to answer both. I'll take them in turn if that's okay. So, the yeah. first one: If I think about um, digital, this has been a process of continual uh, evolution and rapid evolution over the last decade absolutely and and certainly uh, across india when i think about uh hindustan coca cola beverages 10 years ago we were uh honestly and with humility excited that we had you know some type of automation that was happening with a sales order turned into uh something that was produced at the factory and was delivered to the customer and today we have real time visibility of every transaction every piece of data that happens across our entire uh, organization now the the big challenge is what do you do with all that data how do you turn all that data and information into meaningful insights so that we understand um opportunities but also mitigate risks and if i think about just kind of 3 years ago when 
Uh, I first arrived to India, we had one of our big breakthroughs in having a 100% digital factory. So it's completely automated. Everything is kind of talks to each other. And as a result of that, we were able to get um, almost half of the population of workers to be women and break a lot of stereotypes around how factories work in India. Um, what's happened in the last six months has dramatically changed everything. So all of the myths or hypothesis we had about what can be done digitally have been blown away. Uh, you know, with the exception of um, people still go to the factory, people still talk to customer. Um, you know, if there's an issue on one of my production lines, I have virtual reality glasses where I can talk to engineers around the world who can look at the line and fix the line with nobody else being there. Amazing. I can, for anybody who's a business shared services employee or a corporate employee, can actually be anywhere in the country or in the world seamlessly. We had a lot of people who went up country to their home places. We had a lot of people who had to go and take care of families or who didn't have childcare. And we were able to connect everybody digitally completely within minutes so that anybody can work from where they needed to work to be able to support their family as well as the company. So amazing um, opportunities and continuing to challenge. And then the role of learning, I think, has also dramatically improved. Um, throughout the digital advantage and the connectivity we have of people. I spend more time talking to other countries in COVID than I ever have before because I have no concern about the constraints that I previously thought I had, that I had to get on an airplane to talk to somebody. And now I have an opportunity to talk to people all day, every day, um, which has been fantastic. So over the last six months, although we've been very concerned about making sure that we stay safe and operate safely in COVID, a lot of the advances from a digital standpoint have moved forward. Um, specific to your note about Coke, so so two things that make Coca-Cola great, this is the Christina answer, um, not necessarily the official Coke answer, but the official Coke answer would not disagree with me, is really two things. One, where secret formulas and recipes for some of the best tasting, most refreshing drinks in the world. And the second is all about our morals and values. And in today's society, neither one of those things have to change. So uh, we, we do um, kind of protect our recipes, of course, um, but everything is made with the freshest ingredients. Um, and from a value standpoint, this is really what makes Coca-Cola a special place. Um, if I think about my dad when I was a little girl, um, I grew up in a Coke family and my dad always taught me from an early age that Coke was filled with good people who did great things. And, and I try to uphold that and honor that every day. We stay committed to our values and purpose, which is about refreshing the world and making a difference in people's lives, communities, and the planet. And I try to do that each and every day in India and live up to those values. Now, how we go to work and how we work while we're in the marketplace absolutely evolves. The types of products we bring to our consumers, regional, local flavors, and changes that are happening, we absolutely evolve. But the two things we don't evolve is, number one, the great taste of original Coca-Cola, and two, what we stand for as a company inside our communities. Fantastic. So essence is, if you take care of your customer, the customer will take care of the company, whatever the changes it is. Absolutely. And the other piece is if you take care of your associates, your associates own and steward those values of the company for you. So for me, it's all about servant leadership, servant to the customer and consumer, and also to my staff. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Ronnie, coming to you again, similar question. Uh, so this again, I'll just go a little bit into the history. So, uh, I mean, the question is about how do you see or what is the importance you see for the for technology in your companies right through the journey as an entrepreneur? So, I, I especially after the coming of the Forbes article, I think a lot of people know about the initial entrepreneurship venture, laser toothbrushes, and how it was conceptualized because you saw a new technology which could bring in huge productivity, although there was zero experience in it. Maybe that is where a lot of people have been asking this question, but where do you see the importance of technology in your journey as an entrepreneur? So maybe I'll, I'll answer this in three parts. One, yes, I think today COVID is going to accelerate technological innovation, technological urgency, 
and technological acceptance much faster than what would have happened. I think even for people who were naysayers and who felt insecure that technology may replace what I'm doing are now accepting it as a, as a foregone conclusion and figuring out how do they fit into that. So I think one thing that definitely 2020 will be remembered for in many ways is going to be the acceleration of technological solutions to anything, the way we communicate, the way we travel, the way we do consume, the way we learn, the way we consume health and even health, which obviously was always something where you go to as a person. So that I think is really revolutionized the mind. It's like opened a large segment of the left side of your mind, which is only supposed to give you macro thoughts and put that on the right side of your brain and made you really think. And I think for everyone who's listening to us today, they have to figure out therefore, how is technology augmenting that? You know, and this is not about uh, being a complete uh, captive element to your social distractions and your multitasking. I would caution you on that because for a lot of people, technology sounds like I'm multitasking. And, you know, I, I, I'm just a, a absolutely, um, I'm disappointed with the fact that multitasking is becoming a badge of honor, whereas actually, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, a task is a small thing. So basically, not to stray away from that, I think technology is definitely going to get accelerated, urgent, and accepted. Second, I think the point you raised is about the fourth industrial revolution. I think relevant for India today, because, you know, I think we've grown up in the last many, last couple of decades, as, uh, and proudly so, as an arbitrage economy, you know, where IT services have done phenomenally well around the world. And that tech, that tech part has rung along. It's created a middle class in India. But today, if you want to get into the fourth industrial revolution, I think for India specifically now, given everything that's happened in the world, given how most people in most countries are looking at this as national borders now, um, we need to bring in a lot of nonlinear thinking into everything that we're doing. Uh, and technology included as far as that is concerned. And to me, that means that each of us have to, to some extent, not depend so much on the past and precedents. I think a lot of us depend on the past and precedents too much. We have to break that, we have to take a few risks, and we have to go forward. So I think that's the second part. And the third part, I would say, is that even though I've given technology center space, as Christina rightly said, it's the consumer that's the center space. So in all the businesses that I've been in, whether it's been media and then the evolution of everything else from technology and computer graphics to the OTT platforms, and now in ed tech, technology leads, but consumer leads also. And I think that's something we miss out. Otherwise we think now's the technology, let me go find a market. But actually the consumer is there. If you haven't got a consumer to consume that technology, you could be way before your time, you will not be a pioneer and you may fail. So it's a very strong balance between the two and you need that sense of maturity that says tech can't overtake consumer, consumer can't preempt tech. And if you actually, I think the people who look at that and combine the two really understand how to create value, create a great consumer base, you know, and uh, you know, I'm a great fan of, of the Tesla model and Elon Musk, for example. And I think he's found the right mix between extreme technology, but extreme focus on a consumer base also. And if you look at that, that's a good preemption. You know, it's absolutely compelling logic that people would like to feel that they're driving a car that is not consuming gasoline. And yet it's got the power and the glamour. It's not just, it was a, he didn't make a utility vehicle that just said, I've got technology. He made it sound like the most masculine thing and the most feminine thing, you know, a very aspirational car. And yet, if you can marry, and that's my best example that I can give of co combining consumer and technology to really see how we can really win in the 21st century. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, technology is an enabler, but finally customer is who decides. So just use it like that. Perfect. So the next theme I have is about leadership. Uh, both of you have been working with a lot of people. I would say through your career have mentored a lot of people who have gone ahead and become leaders. So this question is pertaining to that. Uh, to Christina, what's HCCB's journey? And uh, so from a leadership perspective, especially let's focus on women leaders in HCCB and in Coca-Cola. So the question is this way, I, I'll uh, directly read it out. How has women leaders played a role in developing HCCB? 
is the cult is is for is the current culture fostering more leaders like that and what is your and what has been your thought process and your leadership style to foster something like that and i think uh, people have seen your videos that's why and i think you have spoken about it in quite a few of them which is where this question comes specifically <laughs> No, I think it's fantastic and I love talking about this. Um, you know, if I think just at a global level, Coca-Cola um is really all about diversity. So the origins of Coke is that it's for everyone. Uh rich, poor, man, woman, all religions, all uh backgrounds and and for me that makes a wonderful link. Um I am proud of the work that we've done in HCCB over the last couple of years, but I'm going to be very honest, there's still a lot we need to do. um and and continuing to drive uh true diversity and inclusion so I'll talk a little bit about women but this is beyond women this is about making sure you harness the power of everybody so um if in Hindustan Coca Cola we had our first female line operator in our Amanpur factory um in Telangana uh in the early 2000s and um today we have women occupying every type of job in the company so obviously within the ceo within um 35% of the board of directors 35% of the slt uh and growing um almost 40% with the leadership team in every part of the organization we have female electricians forklift operators uh line operators sales people head of sales head of legal head of procurement all of these jobs are led by women head of it and technology um from a digital standpoint my digital head is head a woman um and our approach is really simple um this is about capabilities and experiences and getting more people with more capabilities and more experiences regardless of background is really important. Um we want people from all schools, from all different types of education, from all different types of neighborhoods whether it's metro or the smallest village to come and share their thoughts and to be part of our collective, to be able to have the freedom to experience, to experiment, to learn and grow and shape the path and the growth trajectory of HCCB. Um at the end of the day, all our employees want uh similar to our consumers is to be heard, to have a voice, to be able to contribute. Um and that's at the core of our culture. For me as a woman, I always give myself a little bit of a harder time. I have a special responsibility to truly be a role model um for inclusion, to be brave and courageous and resilient, to lead a path for other women. um obviously in india but but around the world to say it's okay um you can grow up in a potentially historically male dominated field and still be a leader um while still being yourself while still being a wife and a mother and a sister and a friend um and all of that can work for you which i think is really important for people to have um people that they can aspire to 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 be like um understanding i'm not perfect but i try to be better each and every single day fantastic thank you so much i will uh, go to ronnie now uh, on the same lines um so uh, this is uh, again reference from the book ronnie wrote dream with your eyes uh, open uh, in in all these uh, context ronnie writes about leadership quite in detail he also talks about developing leadership through challenging funds and uh, fronts and talk about in the utp journey how issues and how challenges have really helped developing it so the question is about how what is your mantra or how what is the thought process on developing the next generation of leaders and how does learning or lifelong learning plays a role play a role in that yeah it's a pretty broad question um <laughs> I think each one has it in each of us. So I think for me the fun has always been to be able to interact with, find and and interact with and identify people and then really co-vision with them. And when you co-vision it's an iterative process, but that co-vision makes you self I I'm very strong on self than anything else and I think self conviction self confidence uh, is very very important. So how do you build that with people where you may imbibe a few thoughts but there is absolutely no way in leadership you can expect someone to clone you or do something with you in any case that is just like you know a command and control basis. So how do we get people first to be able to sharpen their minds? Now the most 
first problem with most people is they feel a sense of fear. You know, am I the right person? Is this the right opportunity? So that whole level of self-conviction is actually the biggest gap to, to uh, bridge to cross, so to speak. And I think if we can cross that bridge of self-conviction, a lot gets done. I think I was very lucky in my early days. Uh, I came from a lower middle class household. Uh, I wouldn't say that's lucky or unlucky, but I'm just saying in a sense it was because it gave me a phenomenal foundation. I also took nothing for granted from day one. You know, that, that entire sense of entitlement that I, that I think that happens today with the younger generation or many people in, that, in the younger generation, I think starts with a flaw in the first place because you either feel entitled and there's no reason why you should be entitled. Okay. And I think the other learning for me was as a first generation entrepreneur, boy, do you get kicked around. You get kicked around. Okay. And again, to that extent, you learn a lot from getting kicked around. So I think at that early stage, one could realize exactly what that would mean. And I think that forced me to get my reservoir of self conviction at a very early stage in life. And I think for most people, at whatever age you are, whether you're 25, 35, or 45, introspect and figure out because at the end of the day we're living we're, we're most accountable to ourselves and so my strong advice would be if you can get your self conviction nobody's going to be able to stop you and to that extent nobody's going to make you feel small nobody will make you feel big when you want to feel big you'll feel big whenever you want to feel small you'll feel small so if we cross this most important element of self conviction to me, that's the best place to be to interact because then everything falls into place after that. I know it's a very simple process and it sounds very elementary, but it actually is life-changing. At least for me, it has been because every time the only reservoir I go to, whether I'm having a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, or if I'm if I'm being challenged in, a, in, a, in an acute business problem where the tougher the business decision, the more hard a, a call it is going to be, finally it has to reflect back on self-conviction so i think that to me is is my single message for everyone who's going to look at that how do you polish it and just be clear i don't think today i'm at the peak of my self-conviction it's a reservoir that keep, keeps getting depleted every day and you it's like energy you wake up in the morning and you got a lot of positive energy because you had a good seven hours of sleep and then everyone around you is sucking up that energy not necessarily in a bad way so what is your, how are you recharging your batteries? And I think self-conviction is a battery recharge. Sure. Rodi, you want to also add how is lifelong learning important there? Because I'm sure, I mean, all throughout your writing, everyone can see how the process of learning continuously and improving yourself is important. Yeah. So I think firstly for everyone, it's very important that we segregate that lifelong learning does not mean, see, I think we've all been so seasoned to education being an event. I go to school and I finish my thing. Then I go to college and I finish. Then it's a, it becomes an event. Now, lifelong learning takes the event out of it. So you don't feel after certain stages that you're going back to learning. It's an ongoing process. So the reason why it's lifelong learning is for God's sakes, don't put a spotlight on it. If you don't put a spotlight on it, it'll happen naturally. If you put a spotlight on it, you're drawing too much attention to your mind on the process that, oh God, I need to do it. Oh, I've got to sacrifice. Oh, I'll have to take 10 hours a week to do that. Oh, I might have to take a year off. Take the spotlight out of it because it's lifelong. You know, in a conveyor belt, no one single item ever gets its moment in the sun. It's a conveyor belt. It all keeps going and something else is always coming out there. So lifelong learning, I think, is accepting the fact that today we have no choice. It's like our first question that you asked us right now, right? The generalists or the specialists. And I think we all have to... If you're a specialist, you'll have to train to be a generalist to a certain extent. If you're a generalist, you definitely want to know a little bit more about each and every area so that even if you have smarter people than you, you have a sense where you're going to be able to cue them. So to me, lifelong learning is not about a degree. It's not about education. It's not about putting a spotlight to it that says I, there's a sudden need for it. It's an ongoing need. So it may be as simple as absorbing and being curious and listening to people and a the other part I would say as a word of caution is just consumption of mentorship content, sitting and listening to webinars like these is not the be all and the end all. It's, I would say it's 20% of your coefficient because the balance 80%, you'll have to figure out how does that affect your life and how are you learning with that? 
Because most of us feel, ah, yes, I am. I'm learning every day. I'm logging on to a webinar today with Christina and Ronnie and, and Arjun. And tomorrow I do that. And, oh, I've been reading one or two books, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And this year, this is what I learned. No, because the retention of that is actually going to be quite low. Unless you, and it's not about making notes of it, unless you translate that into your life and how, because the final lifelong learning is the retention power, not the learning. And it's not the degrees. It's not the negotiating point of you putting one more thing in your CV, which is important, but it's not the most important thing. Perfect. I think uh, that encapsulate. Uh, sorry, yeah, Christina, please. Can I make one build? Is that okay? I know it's off. Absolutely. Off. Absolutely. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm so excited about what Ronnie just said. And for me, um, I have one little tip and trick on how to do that that I use in my own life. Maybe this can help others um, that I think very much correlates. So, so first is um, I, I believe very, very much in the power of intent and purpose. So for me, when I first wake up in the morning, I think about what's my purpose for the day. But Importantly, before I go to sleep, right before I go to sleep, I have two thoughts that I kind of leave myself with before I go to bed. And one of them is, what did I learn today? And, and how am I going to, what one nugget, and how am I going to incorporate that in my life? And then the second is, what, what am I proud of? And, and the reason why, what am I proud of, um, it goes back to refueling that battery. Um, so it's not about egoism. It's not about, um, it's all of us, uh, regardless of, how, how successful or wealthy or powerful or any of those words are, all of us um, are insecure at parts of who we are. And, and I think taking in the moment to think about that learning as a natural part of your life, as a natural part of your day, and then giving yourself permission to refuel, um, I think is really important. And for me, that's part of my daily ritual. And I, I find that it does make a big help. So um, just because I, I so agree with what, he, with what Ronnie said. So sorry for jumping in, but a, a small tip or a trick um, that I find help keep my absolute focus on um, refueling as well as on lifelong learning. Fantastic. Thanks. If, I mean, Christina and Ronnie, please feel free to jump in anytime because this was, I mean, this was a fireside chat. I don't want to. Yeah, no, no, I think, and, and I think, you, and I, I think, Arjun, you picked some three very, very relevant themes that, that should leave a mark with most people. And maybe I'll just add here again, you know, when we're, the takeaways for us, uh, you know, is about, making notes in some form, but it's also really about that sense of retention. I think Christina framed it just so very well. That whole refresher context uh, just adds a lot to it. And then you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to worry about putting that onus on yourself. And that's it. There's no stress moment in lifelong learning. Otherwise, you're in trouble. I think the the answers are so broad and so to the point that a lot of questions which have already come up is answered with these. I'm sure that people are also understanding that. So I'll pick up one or two which are quite specific on the business side of it because uh, quite a few people are also wanting to hear out the, the business uh, pearls of wisdom from both of you. So to Christina, question is, how do you stay on top of the consumer's changing needs? and accelerate the product evolution, especially to suit the post COVID world. There will be changes in channels, there will be changes in customer expectations, preferences. How do we, how do you keep, be on top of it? So um, I will try to give a simple answer to a very complicated <laughs> um, question. And I think that the world today has changed um, so much, not just in India, but truly from a global standpoint, consumers and consumption occasions. So when people experience products have dramatically changed over the six months, um, primarily because people are home, right? So all of the things we used to do outside now we're at home, but the same, uh, a lot of the same activities are replicated. We're all creatures of habit. So uh, interestingly, um, and I'll give you one, one small example uh, from personal experience, but I know it's, it's founded in consumer data across India. So my family and I love going to the cinema. There is nothing like it. And we love going to the cinema hall and, uh, you know, very, 
um, forgive me, this is going to sound so American, but it is, um, but it's also so Indian to go and get a popcorn and a Coke and sit with the family and watch the big screen. Um, and whether that's, you know, kind of an American blockbuster, a Bollywood, um, my husband's favorites are kind of the Telu and Tamil action things where you can hit someone and they fly through the wall. These are the best movies in the world. So um, as you go through this, uh, I want to have that experience, but the cinema hall is closed. So what do I do? Well, now there's a lot of people who've now created that cinema hall inside your house and in your front room, whether it's on a tiny phone or on your home television, if you have one, we're creating that moment. So how do I get that Coke to your house so that you can have the same <clears throat> experience in your home the best as we can until that cinema is reopened? So. People at the end of the day, and I'll just speak about beverages because that's what I do, consume two liters of beverage a day. You're still consuming two liters of beverage whether you go outside or whether you stay home. And making sure that those beverages that you want, and that might be, so I'll tell you for me in my house, sometimes my favorite product is Sprite. <laughs> I want to have a Sprite at three o'clock. It doesn't matter where I am. I'd like my Sprite at three o'clock. In the morning when I wake up, I have a chai. I still have my chai when I wake up. It's nice or when someone else makes it for me, but sometimes this is not possible. So the routines we have still exist. It's about how we as consumer companies can be part of those new routines and part of those new experiences. Because I can't go out to have uh, Ganesha Chaturthi doesn't mean that I don't want to have the festival. I'm trying to have a modified festival in my own home. You know, those types of things are important. So we're learning about our customers and consumers. Um, we have 134 years of data. This is not the first crisis Coca-Cola has emerged stronger through. Um, and we are uh, across 250 countries. So uh, although India is many countries in and of itself, of course, um, we, we learn that the way people are dealing with, with COVID um, is we're all frustrated, we're done. <laughs> But we're trying to adjust as best we can. And it's all about data. It's all about listening, having the channel and the customer. Um, you know, we believe that the existing channels that were closed will reopen um, at some point. But things like grocery, the Kirana, are going to continue to grow and be strong for us. Um, and people will go back outside when we have the vaccine. Eating and drinking will happen. Festivals will happen. Uh, these are thousands of year old traditions. Six months is not going to stop India from going and having the best festivals in the world. Yeah, and I just like, I'd like, I'll, I'll add to that because I think there are three or four words that I picked up from this. You know, for all for everyone looking at the COVID reference, because that seems to be coming up in most of these things. Yes, I think there is a sense of uncertainty. There is definitely an sense of uncertainty, but think about what that is. And Christina used the word habit. I think the one thing that has been disrupted the most is our sense of habit. Now, I think that's not a bad thing, right? I mean, habit can be quite boring. It's very comforting. It's something we're in a comfort zone on. It's nice, it's a habit. And now all our habits have gone. We were doing this, 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 we were doing what. It's all gone. I would say 90% of our habits have actually been taken into a place of, of, of solitude or whatever else. So I think look at the uncertainty as to part of it is because you've had to change your habits and now's a good time to reinvent. Now's a good time to be able to recalibrate and figure out what are the habits I wanted to chuck, which you would not have been able to chuck. And what are the habits I do want to keep? So that's just one thought since everyone's come up with that. And the other word that I think came up, um, especially in the question, was the word change. You know, everything is about change because now with uncertainty comes the other C word, which is change. And I think change is good, but let's not overemphasize that because I think for a lot of people, I find that too much change can also create a lot of uncertainty. And I think it's important that we look at change, which will definitely happen in this in the next 10 years but with a little bit of what I would call consistency. How do you bring about a little bit of consistency? And I think, you know, Coca-Cola is one definitely company that represents a sense of stability and consistency. As Christina, you know, sort of advised us before, it's a secret formula, but it's, it's ages and decades and decades of really feeling I mean, that replicates that if I'm going to consume that, it's a consistent product. I had it when I was young. I had it when I was in my teens. I'm having it when I'm, in, I'm 35. It's a, there's a sense of consistency, but yet there's a marketing campaign that always makes it feel very fresh and effervescent. 
and um, and the brand attachment to it with the younger generation almost makes it sound like okay, but now I'm 45, I feel 25 when I consume that beverage. And that's the beauty of the thought process. So take that same analogy and do what you want to do and bring about what are the consistencies and what are the habits you want to drop and what are the habits you want to keep. Fantastic. Yep. I think that communicates everything in one go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is this very interesting question and I think this is relevant for both of you. This question is about the pressure of leadership. Uh, so the question goes like this. I mean, both of you are leading or and have led legendary organizations. So for if I take Ronnie, Ronnie uh, used to head Disney. I mean, the brand is one of the biggest in the world. The pressures which came with it. Recently, Upgrad bought the number one startup of uh, India by LinkedIn. So all the, and uh, Christina, of course, is heading one of the biggest brand, one of the most loud brand ever to have existed in this world. So this heading such companies comes with a lot of pressure. So the question audience has is, how do you manage this pressure of leadership? And what's the best way to work, uh, I mean, work it out to the best possible outcome? Ronnie, you want to answer first? Yeah, I, I can start first. I can start first. You know, the word pressure almost sounds synonymous with the word stress, and it isn't. Okay, so pressure is, you know what it is, tailwind can be pressure. And you know what happens when tailwind happens to a pressure? An aircraft goes 100 kilometers faster than the 900 kilometers it's supposed to go, and it starts going in 1,000 kilometers. So pressure can be a positive as a tailwind, and it doesn't need to be a headwind. It doesn't need to be stressed. It doesn't need to, you don't have to start thinking of the four engines in the plane are groaning as I'm going forward. In fact, they're actually wheeling forward and they're moving at the right momentum. And with the tailwind, wow. So imagine leadership. And I think maybe the road to becoming a leader, sometimes you can feel the pressure to becoming that. But I think when you're a leader at any stage, and it doesn't mean leadership is not at the top of Mount Everest always. It's at various levels in what you want to do. It's your own definition of your leadership. Leadership in a, it doesn't mean that you're handling more people makes you a bigger leader. And if you're handling less people, it's the task, it's whatever else there. So I think that momentum, we should not look at pressure as a stress point. We should look at it as a very positive element. And if you can bring tailwind, and if you can enjoy that, you actually multiplier effect happens. And I think it's absolutely beholden. Leaders become leaders only when they don't feel the stress but they feel the nice tailwind pressure. So suddenly I want to put a, a, a twist to the word pressure, which everyone thinks is all oh, pressure. Pressure is like not a pressure cooker. Pressure is tailwind. Think about it that way. And I think you might feel, wow, maybe I'll work hard and become a leader tomorrow. Thanks, sorry. Uh, Christina, you want to add anything? Sure yeah, are. no, I love, I, I love this concept. Um, and I do think there is a thing uh, of positive pressure. I completely agree. Um, for me, at the end of it, when I think about kind of what drives people and what's going to make a big difference, um, at the end of the day, I love my job. I love what I do. I love the company I work with. And that makes all of the effort effortless. And I think it's really important. Um, I have so many people, especially young people, who come to me and say, I want to be a CEO. How do I become a CEO? And I ask them, why do you want to be a CEO? Now, I believe everyone can be a leader. But if you want to be a CEO and you only want to be a CEO because you want the designation, if you think this designation equals success, or if you want money or you want to make every single decision, this is not the right reason to be a CEO. You won't like it. And then that pressure becomes a negative pressure. Because, you, you know, it, it's a, all about having a large impact, being very curious about every part of your business and wanting to make sure that you actually empower and trust other people to make decisions. You don't make all the decisions yourself uh, because that's not sustainable. So, so for me, um, leadership is, is self-fueled. Um, it has to be about an alignment of the values you have as a person and the values for the organization you're working or as an entrepreneur. It's about making an impact and a difference in the people's lives, either through product or service. Um, but for me, it's, it's, it's all about 
um, having that personal passion. If you have that personal passion, then you need discipline. Uh, so for me, it's about very strict prioritization of my energy, my effort, my calendar, um, self-care, asking for help. Um, all of, you know, having strength and vulnerability um, becomes really important as you become more and more senior. But it really starts with caring about what you're doing, loving your job, um, and knowing that you can make a bigger difference than you're making today. Perfect. I'll ask one more question, which I can associate with that. So this question is pertaining to uh, the skills or uh, the attitude which an employer looks for. So in India, at least we know that every year, lakhs of people or thousands of people pass out and enter the employ uh, employment space. At the same time, companies continuously complain that they are not able to get the right manpower. So as people who drive large organization and would have in this whole concept problem of hiring the right people, what do you think is missing? Christina, you want to go first on that? Yeah, I'm happy to go first. So, so very specifically in, in India, what I find, this is personal experience, is that we, we often go to some of the best schools and some of those uh, people, quite honestly, have been told they're the best their whole lives, regardless of their social or economic backgrounds, right? So they've been first or second in their batch since they're five years old and they've been told this and by the time they are in their 20s, um, they think they know everything. And in all honesty, I don't want to hire a know-it-all. I want to hire a learn-it-all. How do I get a learn-it-all? Because that learn-it-all is someone who's going to have more hunger and drive and passion to continue to learn, to continue to grow and develop. Um, because all of us can't have the full knowledge of the world at 20 years old, regardless of how intelligent you might be. Um, the other big thing that I look for is less ego from an individual standpoint and more of a collaborator. I need people who can be brilliant but work in teams and are happy to be both the leader as well as the follower. Because there are times when even myself as CEO, I decide to be the follower because there might be a specialist who knows something more about an area than I do. Now, I'm still responsible for asking questions and shaping culture and vision, but knowing when to take lead and when to be, when to be a trusted advisor uh, is also an important bit. And, and then really for me, it's about values. Be a great person. Try to do great things every single day. Um, make a difference in your community and, and really support um, the company and the brands. Yeah, no, I think the learn it all part Christina is, is a very strong summation for everyone as a very strong message, because I think, you know, we talked about entitlement, we talked about everyone coming with a sense of uh, know it all. And I think the learn it all actually means the right values, the right openness, the right attitude. And those are the ones that you really need to get to from what we want to get. Maybe what I'll just add maybe is, you know, I think to, the pointed question is also the soft skills. And I think sometimes your education system doesn't teach you the soft skills. Personally, I'm a product of soft skills. I did my Bachelor of Commerce. I failed in my inter and I stopped learning after BCom. You know, my, my brother has been a PhD. My dad was a was a managing director of a multinational. And here I wanted to just branch out and start, start something on my own at a very early stage. But I'm a product of soft skills. And what do I mean by that? Is that the learning, when you're a product of that, your knowledge exactly that. Learn as you grow is going to be the most important mantra. And I think everything else happens from that perspective. So I think that's one of the things that people, when they say, then they find them a little void in their employability is not really, oh, wait a minute, you didn't understand these three chapters of data analytics. It's never that. Nobody ever comes and says, wait a minute, your knowledge on data analytics does not encompass this, this, and this. Have you ever had a conversation where somebody says, that's why you're not the right person <laughs> for the job? Never. Okay, so it's more about how you can present yourself. Because after all the knowledge that you have, if you can't communicate the same, for example, which is a very important, and communication doesn't mean you need to be the best English accent or any accent. You don't need to be necessarily the one who doesn't, you can communicate in whichever main manner you want to. But that power of soft skills today, this element of competitiveness, the element of communication, the element of so many other things today, are I think the reason why many people find that they now need to, but the only problem we do is that we find they're unemployable 
in some sense or lacking. And then we put them through another formal process versus what I think is an important need for a slightly more informal process. And I would really urge companies that says, you know, you come in, okay, you're not ready, three months off you go. And that's three months more of what they have to do. So firstly, 50% of everything that you would have learned, you've had to unlearn. Now you're going another three months. So you added a lot more, another 10% to your 50%. And when you come back, you'll have to unlearn. So if you look at those elements there, I think soft skill plays a very, very important task. You can figure out what are your best soft skills. I may consider myself a good communicator and that's my soft skill. I want to get through with it. Somebody else may think he's a great storyteller. Somebody else may think uh, I'm a, I'm, my clarity and conviction is very, very different. Each one has to have their own. But you need one or two more things than the domain knowledge that you represent for you to really excel. But just a follow-up question on that, which came I think, in. Christina, is... Christina, you wanted to add something, I think. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Just, so if I think about just inside my own organization here in India, from a senior leadership standpoint or a mid-level leadership standpoint, the single biggest class I send people to or classes, they're around communication. And we had, September was our learning month. We do one month a year where we super accelerate training and we have all of our leaders trained. So I actually trained a class myself uh, on September 1st, and I actually did something around effective communication specifically because of that. So even if you're great, I would say there's more we can do. And, and it's really beyond, Ronnie, to agree with you, it's beyond English language. It's about yes. the clear articulation of your thoughts and ideas. Um, and, and, and I would encourage everyone on this call to spend some time um, thinking about how you're communicating effectively as opposed to just the data you're communicating. And, and that's really been um, an absolute um, game changer for a lot of people that I've spoken to either trying to find jobs or who already have employment. And this is a sort of a follow-up question which came in that uh, question is soft skills. Uh, I mean, if you look at the industry market today, there are a lot of packages which claim to be training people on soft skills, but that's not something which is easily trainable. It requires a lot of intent from the individual also to do it. So question is, what should be the approach to train yourself in soft skill? I'll give you my example. Um... I don't, I'm not a strong believer in mentorships, uh, for example. Uh, I, don't have, I didn't have any, too many mentors at my early stage. But the ones that I really valued as mentors were people who asked me the toughest questions. Now, coming to my example, when I decided my communication skills, um, in college, you know, some people, and, and in school, some people do boxing, some people want to do athletics. I chose elocution, debate, and drama. And... One of the most interesting lessons with somebody who came in, who was two years my senior, and he was teaching me elocution and debate. So the first time I was elocuting, and he says, no, this is not going to work. No, this is not going to work. And then finally, he just took a recorder and recorded what I want to do. And then he said, just hear this back. And what I'm trying to say here is that the one single tool that can happen, you got to find your tool of if you want to, the best way you can figure out whether you're doing something right or wrong is as they say symbolically, look at yourself in the mirror and or hear yourself in your thing. And it's as, it's as simple a discipline as that. If you think that you wanna go out and you spend seven days on a concept or a presentation that is so powerful, spend another 15 minutes to articulate it to yourself on a recorder and see if you would buy that product based on the presentation you made. If it's not, go back and re-record yourself and spend the whole night and that night spend three hours of sleep instead of seven hours of sleep before the 9 a.m. presentation and get that right. I think that encapsulated. You are your biggest teacher. Okay, I think we are coming to the end of this session. I think, I think so, Christina has definitely got a point of view on that. <laughs> no, I love that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 we're running out of time, but yeah. Yeah. The first time I saw myself recorded or heard my own voice, I was horrified. But, you know, I, because in my, in my head, I have a very deep voice, but this is not true, I know. But, but I do think it's a really important thing. I would discourage people from taking tons and tons of classes. I also am a little concerned about mentorship myself. I think just because the expectations people have is that you're going to meet some magical guru who's going to help you fix everything about yourself, this is not going to happen. 
right? So, so you can have a variety of mentors that you can learn different things from different people. Um, my technique that I found pretty effective is this concept of accountability partnering. So what this basically means is people in your life who will kick you when you do something wrong, not literally, right? So if you feel like um, you are feeling uncomfortable when you're speaking or, and you're not participating, having someone who's going to be in the room next to you, it doesn't matter what their designation is, what their relationship is. It's about trust to be able to go, oh, Ronnie, do you have something you'd like to add? Or if you know that you keep on starting and talking and you don't stop, so we have some of this uh, in, in, you know, some of my my lovelies will start with, let me explain to you the history of the world before I answer your question, right? So, and then we start with 4,000 years ago. Whenever this happens, then it's a different, <laughs> help answer the actual question, right? So these types of people in your life, professionally and personally, can help guide you, but you have to be honest with them and say, this is my problem. This is what I'm trying to solve. When you see me do this, please discreetly let me know is sometimes more effective than a formal mentor because the formal mentor normally is not watching you every day and experiencing with you the issues and the challenges. Pick someone who's there, who's at the table, who's in your life, who can tell you they may not be the perfect guru or teacher of something, but they know when you're stopping, when you're being ridiculous, when you're fighting for there's no fight, all of these types of things. So, so be more pragmatic about it would be, would be my advice. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. So I, uh, we are out of time and I don't, and I think this session was uh, very different uh, and I'm seeing the fear that the chat, which people are talking about, it's like, it's not, it's unlike any session we have done. This is, this is the kind of feedback which is coming in. So, which is really good. I think it was a lot out of the box. Uh, hence, I don't want to end the session with a typical conventional uh, question of can you send out a message to everyone, uh, because I think what we did through the session is our message and this is nothing more to speak about. I want to thank once more both of you, uh, Christina, I know the time is odd on East Coast, the connection was uh, problematic still you came in thanks so much for making time. And to Ronnie, I know how busy you are. Still, you accepted this one hour. Thanks so much for doing it. No, um, it's fun. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I had, uh, we had... <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Christina. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Christina. Thank you. Thanks, Sergeant. Thank you so much.